It's not often that I get the chance to, uh, to speak under such columns. Uh, I'll try to, you know, that's, it's, like a, it's like a kind of dream setting here for, uh, for all of us. And uh, one, thing about, one thing about terminology, uh, you know, uh, Tom, Tom referred to uh, the subject of our, uh, of our discussion as, as Rick. Uh, some, some, uh, some who are even more familiar might uh, be inclined to call him Ricky. Uh, but speaking for myself, I think today he deserves to be just Olmsted, the Olmsted. The others, will, you know, his father will be Olmsted Senior. Uh, this is this is the Olmsted. So let me begin this uh, discussion on Olmsted and and, and city planning uh, by observing that, uh, like like many uh, like like many uh, uh, tribes. Uh, uh, that, that trace their ancestry back to particularly large and powerful animals. Uh, the planning profession traces its an ancestry back to that uh, mastodon of, uh, of city planning literature, the 1909 Plan of Chicago by Burnham, by Burnham and, and Bennett. Uh, but uh, John Peterson, uh, the author of the uh, masterful book, The Birth of City Planning, has shown that really the decisive event in the uh, evolution and the growth of city, in the birth of city planning as a profession uh, took place in 1909, but it wasn't the Chicago plan. It was the, the meeting, uh, the first meeting of the National Conference on City Planning that actually took place right in, right, uh, right in this city. And not so much what was happening publicly, but the great debate that was happening behind the scenes uh, between Olmsted uh, and the organizer of the conference, Benjamin C. Marsh. And Marsh was a social reformer, uh, what we today would call an advocacy planner who wanted planning to concentrate on housing and especially on the issue of congestion and tenement housing. Uh, Olmsted, uh, in contrast, argued for what he called comprehensive planning. And he brought to this debate, uh, of course, his father's legacy, his central position in landscape architecture and in this new world of uh, of city planning, his, uh, his involvement with, the, with, uh, with planning since the Macmillan plan, uh, but also something you might not, not suspect, which was a kind of talent for backroom politicking that I think would have impressed even the, uh, the Pals of Boston and other cities. And as a result, he managed to basically marginalize Marsh and this uh, advocacy planning uh, wing of the early pl uh, city planning movement in, uh, uh, in favor of this comprehensive planning. Now, what does that, what does that word, that critical word mean uh, to him, Compre uh, comprehensive? Uh, he defines comprehensive city planning as the intelligent control and guidance of the entire physical growth and alteration of cities. I think that's comprehensive. And it raises this very interesting issue, among other things, in regard to what Tom was saying, what Tom was saying earlier, that yes, there was a tremendous humility in him as a person, as someone who understood uh, the, complexity, uh, the complexity of cities. But he was also driven by the way he defined city planning, by the ambition uh, to uh, control this uh, immense machine of the city to conceive of this, to conceive of city planning in this extremely ambitious way. And I think this issue, uh, humility and ambition, uh, will go through, you know, defines in so many ways his life and, and the whole uh, 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 issue, the whole, the whole difficulty of city planning itself. 
So in terms of this comprehensive idea that uh, for him, city planning was a single complex subject. And he emphasizes uh, above all the interconnectedness of the urban and hence the need for a profession that could somehow master all of these different elements of it. Urban design, landscape architecture, transportation, sanitation, the regulation of subdivisions, uh, dem demographics, to bring all of these things together in a synthesis that creates both order and beauty. Uh, there is you know, the heart of that, uh, that ambition. But as we, as we heard from, uh, from Tom, from David, and Tim, uh, Olmsted understood that planning could not be a, uh, a once-for-all uh, once uh, spasm. It had to be a process uh, that takes place over time, is, op uh, is open to change. Uh, and so uh, he, under, you know, he understood, plan you know, let, let me put it this way, uh, uh, he anticipated, by almost a century, the the argument, uh, the uh, the arguments or the con uh, or the concepts of uh, of planning today, uh, including Alex Garvin's new book, uh, The Planning Game. Uh, so, the uh, the the third thing is that he meant comprehensive. Uh, not just at the large scale, comprehensive planning was a methodology, this complex methodology that could be applied uh, to many scales, from, uh, you know, from the smallest subdivision to the scale of the region. But in every case, the planner had to have the, the whole in mind, the, large, the, the, good, the good of the whole. And I think that brings me to what I would see, at, at least as the essence of this comprehensive uh, ideal, that for Olmsted and for his contemporaries in the progressive era, uh, the, the, ter the term the public interest was a reality. Uh, there you know, was something that could be known, something that could, uh, that could be grasped. And the basic method was to rely on uh, a civic-minded elite, which was also taken, uh, you know, taken at its own uh, valuation, to identify the public interest to carry out uh, the plan. So the planning is this alliance between uh, the elite and a, a professional elite that is itself highly, uh, highly skilled. And of course, you know, when Tom was speaking uh, earlier this morning about uh, the difficulties of planning, the hesitations, uh, the loss of confidence, in so many ways, it's exactly a loss of confidence, both in this idea of a public interest that can be known and identified, and in the competence uh, of a profession to uh, carry out and interpret that. And this is, I think, the you know, one one sees this uh, in Olmsted's own in Olmsted's own life, because this uh, comprehensive vision of planning, this comprehensive vision of planning, leads to great successes, and I would mention one in particular that is perhaps less known, and that is uh, his World War One service as manager of the town planning division of the United States Housing Corporation, uh, which provided emergency uh, housing for war workers, and in spite of the, uh, uh, you know, the rush schedule and so on, created arguably the best affordable housing that we've ever built in this, uh, uh, in this country. So there were uh, great successes, but as we'll see, immense frustrations uh, and and disappointments, as Olmsted, you know, as we learned so graphically from David, as Olmsted confronts the reality of the American city, and uh, the you know, these complex these complexities. And I hope in our discussion, I'm sure in our discussion, we will in fact uh, uh, try to uncover uh, more more of these issues. So. Uh, 
Uh, we are going to begin with Peter Pollack, who will, uh, add, who will give us uh, an account and analysis, an analysis of the Olmsted plan for Boulder, Colorado that he knows well, uh, and, you know, and its impact over time. Then Arlene Levy, who will be talking about subdivisions and their uh, impact and role on his larger philosophy. Uh, and finally, Alex Garvin, who will be Alex Garvin and, and uh, a source of, uh, of, of wisdom and contrarian opinions. <laughs> so uh, with that, I call on Peter. The uh, PowerPoint. Uh, good morning. I feel quite at home with all this rain. We've had a lot of rain in Boulder, Colorado recently, so um, thanks for that, I guess. I come uh, at this as a planning practitioner. I had a 25-year career in the city of Boulder, uh, the last seven as planning director. And uh, I was curious about how Boulder came to be the way it was when I started doing my planning work. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that history, but the first real plan for Boulder was created by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. in 1908, uh, when Boulder was just a town of 10,000 people. So uh, we're going to take a, quite a divergent path from Washington, D.C. and Baltimore uh, to a frontier town out in the Rocky Mountains uh, to have this story. So I want to share some of his work. I want to talk about the fate of his projects. And I want to try to draw some lessons from that legacy. So this is uh, Boulder as it appeared uh, about that time, the early 19, uh, 1900s. Um, and I think the thing that you take away immediately if you've ever been to Boulder is its scenic quality. If there wasn't a town there, it probably could be a national park. So it's the kind of place that has that sort of special scenic um, quality that I think Olmsted was very sensitive to and wanted to see the city develop in that context and preserve the natural character uh, that was, was there. And I think the best that could be said about some of our city planning is that we haven't screwed it up too badly. Uh, Olmsted was first in Colorado in 1894, so he came out as a recorder and instrument man, as he said. Uh, for a project to do the triangulation of the 39th parallel. So that put him into the Rocky Mountains uh, west of Denver. And like a lot of us who've had experiences in the Rocky Mountains, uh, I think it probably drew him back uh, to Boulder and probably took that commission partly because he wanted to come back to Colorado. Uh, and he went on to do some wonderful work after his Boulder work in Denver for the mountain parks and in Colorado Springs for uh, a variety of projects. His last uh, letter in the file um, that I have seen is in 1931, so it actually was a fairly long-term engagement, although we think of the plan in 1908. He did several projects, as I'll talk about afterwards. So who were his clients for this plan? So it was the Boulder City Improvement Association. This is prior to any official city kind of parks board or planning board or that type of thing. Uh, Henderson was a lawyer, judge, and professor at the university. Eben Fine was a pharmacist and the first uh, director of what became the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Dr. Baird, whose handwriting I've had to get used to, uh, was the uh, correspondent with Olmsted, uh, and not a very good penman, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, a doctor and treated a lot of people who uh, had TB, uh, and Boulder was a, a mecca for people coming out to try to take a cure. Uh, Fred White was uh, a supervisor of mining interests for his family, uh, then became basically a real estate agent in town. Uh, Maude O'Dell uh, was uh, a wealthy widower, uh, and she was uh, doing all sorts of things in terms of schools and that type of thing, but here you can see she's on the Standing Committee of Education and Floral Culture. I love that. So the boulder that Olmsted came out to, uh, the reason there's a town there is because of gold. So gold was discovered, like in Denver, 
uh, up in the mountains of, uh, above Boulder. Um, that's an image from 1876 when Colorado became a state. Uh, he came to a town with dirt streets. Uh, there was a little um, uh, home to squatters along Boulder Creek um, called Jungle Town, so uh, where he did some of his work in terms of creek improvements. That was railroad yards and people were squatting there. Um, and you can see in the image on the lower left, uh, Boulder was essentially a treeless town. There were cottonwoods and willows along the creek, but the, it's a high desert environment and there were not many trees there. But Boulder had big aspirations, and they wanted to transition from this mining history, a town of uh, a mining supply town, and become something more. And so in 1874, it became home to the University of Colorado. Uh, the sanitarium that was actually an outgrowth of the sanitarium and uh, the Kellogg's uh, developed, um, opened in 1894. Uh, Chautauqua, we have one of the last permanent Chautauquas west of the Mississippi in, in Boulder. Uh, 1898 it opened up. And the Hotel Boulderado was built by public subscription in 1909 so that we had an adequate place for people to come and stay. For those of you who speak this language of the Olmsted jobs, um, most of the records are really in 3300 and 3302. A lot of things were opened up but never went to real fruition. So this is what we think of when we think of the Olmsted plan, and we do call it the Olmsted plan. We don't throw in the junior. Um, maybe that's our own ignorance, but um, the, it, it really was, it was published in 1910, but it's based on a visit in 1908, a 10-day visit he had. Um, there were some production problems along the way. I'm sure planners are familiar with that, of getting the final report out. Um, and I think the other thing to notice on this graphic is that it is in his name as a professor at Harvard. And I think the townspeople had heard of him and said, we want Olmsted to come to town. Um, there was a letter writing back and forth, and he tried to actually defer to other people in the firm, but they said, no, we want you. So I think there was a very personal kind of outreach and approach. So there's a, a long report, a uh, report on improvements. And there's also this plan of improvements. And this is uh, based off of a base by a local cartographer. The, what, the thing to take away from this image really is that what he focused on in this, uh, the plan here is the street system. Uh, this was a you know, haphazardly growing small town, so where should we make the connections? Park locations at the neighborhood and community scale. A greenway famously along our creek, which is the long line here. Let's see if I can going through here. So this is the mountain backdrop of the city. It's a town right up against the foothills. And there's a creek that flows from Boulder Canyon through the community. And so he talked about a greenway along Boulder Creek. And he talked about filling in some land that was already owned publicly, but creating a, what he called a city forest, which we today would call our mountain backdrop. So open space along that area. So, the report. Purpose is to offer helpful suggestions drawn from experience and observation in many other cities and from a brief and limited, though eager, study of Boulder. I like that. Bearing upon one of the broad fundamental questions at the base of all municipal activities, namely, what physical improvements, so he really focused on what physically could be done within the reach of the city will help it make it increasingly convenient, agreeable, and generally satisfactory as a place in which to live and work. Um, I think the thing that's striking to me when I read it is that he really grasped the opportunity in Boulder in terms of a high quality environment that could attract people to come and live there and that that would be the transition from this mining supply town and that he was talking about a city of fine homes in a university town setting and that was a vision that he had about the next transition from this mining supply town. So what's in there? It was really a focus on the public realm, lots about streets and sidewalks and paving, a whole section on different kinds of materials to use to get rid of those dirt streets. What we should do with our waterways, he was very struck with not only our creeks, but our ditches, which are used for irrigation purposes out of the mountain. Address the issue of flooding, which I'll come back to. 
parks at that neighborhood community and sort of regional scale, um, but down to detail on public buildings, sewage. We also didn't, we dumped our sewage into the creek, and so he said we probably should stop doing that. Um, signage, and this issue of public administration, the need for permanent administration of the plan itself. So how do you implement the plan? Um, and at that time, obviously, the arrows in the quiver of planners were relatively limited. So there's a lot in the report that tries to make the business case. Why is it sound business to make sure that you have trees and parks and streets that are grand? Um, so he tries to make an economic argument, largely, and says that the city requiring developers to make right-of-way or park dedication, it's not a socialistic project, it creates value for the subdivider. So the subdivider should see this as a good uh, for their development. And he uses the terms takings and parking, which I love because takings in this case is really about public park acquisitions, and parking is about making parks. Um, so I think that's something we should actually return to in terms of our understanding about things. But this is not where it stopped, and I think a lot of people conceive of the Boulder work as that report and that plan, but he did work on residences, streets, uh, worked with Metcalf and Eddie on engineering studies, did a lot of work on um, creek sections and dams, uh, did some school planting plans, a bridge for us, um, some park boundary issues, and uh, for us, our little central park. But like all plans, as we've talked about already, um, there's a variety of fates that come to plan. So I want to run through some examples of these pretty quickly. So the first one is the close call. He consulted with the University of Colorado president about plans for the campus, which was at that time about 1,300 students. It's now a school of about 30,000 students. Um, and they had a meeting and they talked specifically about the siting of the building in the upper left, which is Mackey Auditorium. And he did a plan uh, sketched at a meeting down in Denver with the CU president. And as you can see in the quote, he wrote to a fellow landscape architect, Pars, I'm sorry to hear that the university people are floundering. I rather thought they would. <laughs> so that one didn't work out. And ultimately, Day and Clowder uh, did the 1919 plan for the expansion of the campus, which is a beautiful campus, uh, but you wonder what would have happened. Uh, so there's a close call. Um, he did a planting plan and sketch map for the State Preparatory School. This was the first high school in Colorado. Um, it was built, uh, but then demolished. So it's sort of tied into that whole historic preservation issue of uh, these buildings, as so as goes the building, sometimes goes the landscape. Um, and that site, so it was demolished in 1937, and it's become part of the Pearl Street Commercial District. But you can see uh, a tree over there uh, on the right side, and a notice about all the work they're doing to try to rehab that tree. And I talked to the city forester, and he thinks that that tree was an original tree specified by Olmsted. So here we have a little toehold in terms of the original Olmsted vision. Uh, there's a place um, called Lover's Hill, now called Sunset Hill, um, a Mesa kind of formation opposite the University uh, Hill area. And he m noted, and this is uh, inscribed in this little um, piece of pavement on the lower right, that the view at sunset is one that cannot be matched in many thousand miles of traveling. So he was really struck by walking along this Mesa, and on his plan, it's painted green. And this was a place that he thought should be preserved. Uh, it is now uh, a field of houses. And this little path that joins the upper part of the hill to the lower part of the hill is our commemoration to his vision. Uh, unfortunately, not one that was realized. Here's our little central park. Um, and we'll look at, we'll actually see an image of a larger vision he had for the area along Boulder Creek. Um, and this is now uh, a very popular uh, part of our downtown, adjacent to our commercial area. Um, so this is one of those projects that got built, but it was substantially changed over time. Uh, note here, I mean, you can see the creek flowing through in this area, but I, I think, you know, this really exhibits the notion of sort of exterior plantings and sort of an open green in the middle. Uh, didn't exactly turn out that way. 
Uh, that's the initial uh, image of it from 1929. You can see that this was basically, this was land owned by the railroad, leased from them uh, until it was permanently purchased in 1933. And here's what it looks like today. But there were some incursions here. So like many cities, they succumbed to the strong temptation to put things in parks. And a band shell was added in 1938 and a train in 1952. Here's a bridge, the Broadway Bridge, goes over Boulder Creek near Central Park. Uh, this was also built, but then subsequently changed in 2003. Uh, but you can see they took the original light standards off and put them in a park stand uh, setting. Um, and a lot of the elements and detail are actually quite sympathetic. Uh, and we're actually quite happy that this bridge was rebuilt because it uh, weathered the flood a lot better than otherwise. But things change dramatically, as we've talked about, especially in this post-World War II period. The next big plan that was done for Boulder was done by S.R. De Boer in 1948, and it was a plan for growing Boulder. And the idea was to connect Boulder to the Denver economy and to substantially grow the city, become an employment center, um, and substantially grow. So they built a turnpike from Denver to Boulder. Uh, this is the image from Broomfield to the uh, foothills, and there, there's the Rocky Mountains at the top, a little boulder at the base of it. This is now all filled in. Eisenhower came out to dedicate the Department of Commerce in 1954. And Boulder, in this case, could be a poster child for sprawl. This was the housing development that came along with that growth. And so our reputation for growth management at one period uh, was a little tougher. So partly in reaction to that, people have rediscovered some of the elements of Olmsted's plan. So uh, the first dedicated sales tax for open space, purchase, open space purchase was done in 1967. Um, and at that time, uh, the Olmsted report was republished as part of the campaign to raise those sales taxes. That's been a very popular program. We now have preserved around the city 45,000 acres of land. Also, his notions about what to do with Boulder Creek were rediscovered. And in 1987, a seven-mile path, which does not have to cross a street, was constructed. So similarly inspired by his ideas. And that system has been expanded to include all of our greenways and tributaries. So you can bike all through town uh, using our tributary system. Oops. I mentioned his earlier broader vision for the downtown. Uh, this is one of those uh, projects that succumbed to uh, bond issues that didn't pass. Um, so this was to be a World War I memorial and a broader area from 9th Street to 17th Street. And elements of this have been actually completed over time. And just this year, there's been a project to uh, do the Civic Center plan. And there was a design competition. Many of the people who submitted reference back to Olmsted's vision and it restores, uh, the plan that's been adopted restores many of those elements. So let me finish up here really with two things. One is, what does this say about sort of the evolution of comprehensive planning? So as a practitioner, I'm interested in looking at what he contributed and how that has changed over time as planners. And the power of vision, which I think is sort of the takeaway for me about how uh, he's continued to uh, influence Boulder's history. One is the issue of authority. So we had a city improvement association. We've moved now to a city charter, board, staff, regulation of private land, those kinds of things, capital improvements. So there's been much work in trying to establish clear authority for the carrying out of the plan. Two, legitimacy. So he was working primarily with local elites. These, you know, the city improvement association, uh, they didn't go and talk to the people in the jungle. Uh, they went and did their plan. Um, so we're in much more of a participatory democracy today in terms of how we carry out our plans. Comprehensiveness, we've talked about that already, this issue about going from the public realm and including the regulation of private land. Um, so, and also the whole idea of integrating general plan elements and the broader frameworks like sustainability. And lastly, adaptive management. This notion of a one-time plan, you know, you shouldn't wait every 40 years to do a plan, probably should do it a little more often. Um, doing up, um, updates over time. 
and this idea of dealing with uncertainty over time. And many of us are looking at this issue of scenario planning as a way to try to anticipate different kinds of futures, a different way of doing comprehensive planning. And then finally, the, the power of vision. So we went from the city forest idea to open space in mountain parks, went from preserving Boulder floodway to the Greenway tributary plan. And we've had you know, some benefit from that. So we've been in the news lately for things like wildfire and flood. And I think that this sort of speaks a little bit to some broader ideas about resiliency, green infrastructure, um, you know, different ways of characterizing some of the improvements that have been made here. Uh, many in our community think we've been put in a better position because of our open space buffer in terms of the impact of wildfire. And many in the community think that we've been in a better position for flood because we did the improvements along the creek and created the capacity to carry those flood waters in a natural way, you know, much less loss of life um, and property. So I think that Olmsted helped change people's minds about the potential for our city. Uh, it sometimes took a while, but his ideas have shaped our city to our benefit. Thank you very much. Many of us sup at the same resource table, and so um, images and concepts get repeated. And by the time you leave, they will be imprinted upon you, if, particularly if you're from out of town. Um, in 1919, reflecting on his career from the perspective of his 25th Harvard reunion, Frederick Law Olmsted listed three seminal events which had influenced his thinking and his practice. The first, while he was still a student, which you've heard about before, was the planning for the World's Fair, working among, among men of great creative ability, including his father, in, quote, a rush job for an artistic ideal. This 1893 exposition, a plaster white city of classical monuments offset by green space, thanks to the senior Olmsted's genius, offered the potential of orderly reform for cities in its transformative aesthetics. Although it ignited a wave of nationwide urban beautifications, these projects tended to be single-purpose ameliorations in the public realm rather than broader planning. The second, sorry, the second event evolved from the first, but expanded these ideas beyond the mere civic beautifications to include the rejuvenation of an entire city, Washington. The Senate Park Commission, led by Senator James McMillan and made up of former World's Fair colleagues, was ostensibly to consult on the city park system in 1901. Instead, it expanded its mission, as we have seen, uh, to recapture L'Enfant's grand architectural vision for the nation's capital but it expanded it beyond um, the urban core. Washington was to be an exempl exemplary in all aspects of a healthy modern city, the dignified capital for a world power. The bold idealism of this commission's work had an impact for decades to come well beyond Washington's geographic boundaries. For the nation's capital, ensuring an artistically cohesive implementation of that vision would be an undertaking which Rick Olmsted guarded and guided over 50 years of involvement. Beyond Washington, the Macmillan Commission's recommendations stimulated nationwide planning for integrated urban infrastructure and amenity improvements, profoundly altering ideas about management for the physical city. Additionally, it spawned the new profession of city planning with Rick Olmsted as its acknowledged leader. The third formative event, uh, which Bob just rem remarked upon, uh, less well publicized, was still fresh, very fresh in Olmsted's mind in 1919. He and his colleagues had contributed their service to aid the emergency wartime planning for military cantonments and war industry housing. Less monumental than the other events, this critical war work under compelling time constraints focused directly upon the community planning 
and its impact upon the individual and the family level. With this event, planning theories had to be put to the concrete test, literally and figuratively, as teams developed design standards and supervised very rapid construction. Temporary but efficient cities with all necessary infrastructure had to suddenly arise for the new military recruits, all done at minimum cost. From the military camps in 1917, Rick Olmsted became the manager of the town planning division for the housing court, responsible for the creation of livable neighborhoods with all necessary public services and a modicum of amenity. These were to house the workers and their families in industries critical to the war effort, shipbuilding, munitions, and essential manufacturing. The design teams worked diligently to create communities of economically viable small houses which knew, looked neither like penal colonies nor stage sets. This wartime work, however, proved the tipping point, I think, for Rick Homestead's concentration on urban planning. Despite the very evident need across the nation for housing for well-planned communities, particularly at the worker level, the federal government shut down these programs at the armistice, abandoned half-built towns, and spent no time analyzing the lessons learned to guide future public projects. Entrenched military bureaucracy, short-sighted governmental management rife with property rights conflicts and fear of landlordism made this an interesting but frustrating exercise for, the Oms for Olmsted. In the pre-war decade, flush with the enthusiasm for the new planning profession, Olmsted was extremely busy. In addition to his membership on the newly appointed Commission of Fine Arts, he had developed the city planning program at Harvard addressed organizations, wrote articles, and provided reports to various cities to plan for continuous rather than spasmodic future growth. As the years passed, however, his optimistic outlook on this endeavor dimmed in the face of minimal implementation of his recommendations, at least at that time. And he, he just found that city planning wasn't reaching where he needed it to be in this early in these early 20s. Uh, as a, a product of his father's teaching, the city for Olmsted should be a positive force for the advance of civilization, a productive, a productive environment where individuals could pursue and shape the American dream. Enmeshed in the science of statistics, economic uncertainties, and competing interests, the intended, intended benefits of comprehensive city planning to provide a healthy, safe, attractive milieu for all inhabitants were often minimized. Therefore, since planning was too indirect a path to achieve this dream, in this post-war period, Olmsted turned more of his creative energies to design on the ground, to the crafting of residential communities and institutions with character and amenity. And at the larger scale, he focused on planning for the preservation of America's great wilderness resources. Residential design made up the bulk of the Olmsted firm practice. About 500 commissions or consultations were for subdividing, subdivision projects. Most started as suburban, even exurban, such, such as particularly the resort communities. But many were gradually absorbed into their adjoining cities and metropolitan areas. There were notable developer clients for whom Rick Olmsted in particular did multiple projects for residential conglomerations. The resort communities such as Mountain Lake, Florida or Fishes Island, New York for Frederick Ruth, who had grown up in the Olmsted planned suburb of Roland Park. Developments in the Berkeley, San Francisco area for Duncan McDuffie, which included the very picturesque enclave of St. Francis Wood. And for New Yorker, New York banker Frank Vanderlip, the remarkable enterprise for the Palos Verdes Peninsula about which we will hear. These businessmen recognized that the lasting economic value of an Olmsted landscape artistry and their comprehensive planning would pay off in the future. 
The aesthetic principles fundamental to the senior Olmsted's park designs were also core in residential planning. Protective of intrinsic scenic character of the site, projects were designed as integrated whole compositions, details subordinated to the overall plan, to an overall vision and a unity of the intended purpose for the planning. As Olmsted succinctly stated, the success of the whole depended on the harmony of all the parts, that no class of physical change should be made without this consideration. To avoid monotony, the imaginative inventiveness of many individuals should be given scope as long as they were congruent to the overall conception, a point especially important in architectural embellishments for suburbs. The light motif which characterized the iconic suburb of Riverside, Illinois, continued to influence later Olmsted subdivisions, that these should be places apart from the commercial grid, designed to imply leisure and domestic life, offering communal open space to encourage, quote, friendly, unceremonious greetings of all classes. To retain such lofty goals, Riverside properties were protected by restrictions concerning architectural cost, style, and usage, a practice which became integral to Olmsted design canon for later subdivisions. Such coven covenants codified the aspirations of the developer, the architects, and indeed the early purchases of the intended, that the intended aesthetic and monetary values would be retained. Self-perpetuating architectural covenants and administrative mechanisms were a major component in the 1909 Russell Sage Foundation's experiment for Forest Hills Garden. This business investment for a fair profit by philanthropy was out to prove that there was money in taste, even for smaller incomes. More than concern for aesthetics, however, this experiment was to demonstrate that modest homes could be well built economically and with attractive amenities. And these were the standards which had really influenced a lot of the World War II, uh, uh, World War I town housing plans. The unique community which emerged in Forest Hills, a harmonious assemblage of imaginative architecture, both detached and multiple dwellings, on diversified streets in garden like neighborhoods, was the collaborative product of Rick Olmsted and Grosvenor Atterbury. Its architectural controls indeed retained its investment value and its distinctive sense of place over the decades. Frank Boughton, another astute community builder, an Olmsted client for 40 years, collaborated with Rick Olmsted on a sequence of successful subdivisions in greater Baltimore, Roland Park, Guilford, Homeland, and the resort community of Gibson Island, which you can sort of see there. An architectural oversight board monitored house designs, which ranged from large detached homes to modest multiple dwelling courts, all to fit into a cohesive composition for diverse incomes. From the scenic enclave of Roland Park to the rolling meadowland of Guilford to the woods of Homeland, different communities were forged set apart but accessible from, but accessible to the city beyond. On streets punctuated by churches, parks, and schools, neighborhoods were differentiated by architectural style, materials, lot sizes, and setbacks, defined by a hierarchy of avenues, roads, and lanes to move from commercial to domestic scale. Olmsted planning took special care to retain and enhance any natural site features, trees, ponds, boulders, vistas, and to provide for attractive user amenities. Since the devil is in the details, he, he produced gently curving streets, grouping houses in relation to each other and to the road shape and gradient. Street tree plantings were critical to the whole composition, varied at specific points, intermingling upper canopy with small flowering trees so that it should appear that the roads were running through natural glades. Boughton, recognizing the intrinsic value of such details, was an active partner in these design decisions, 
a good a developer is always a good thing to have. Even challenging his architects to find a solution to what he called the always awkward garage issue for these now automobile suburbs. This is just a soup song of the design, of the subdivision designs for the Olmsted firm's canon of work, which rem really remains largely unexplored. Idealism intermingled with pragmatic business acumen created these residential communities, which have for the most part retained their artistry and value throughout the changing tides of taste. They continue to be instructive, inspiring examples of city betterment. The Olmsteads, father, sons, partners, and acolytes fervently believed in an educated citizenry and public-spirited civic leaders that they were the key to ensuring that the beauty, much of which they had created, would continue to enrich urban environments. For us all, the task is at hand to understand and steward this landscape patrimony. Thank you. I'd like to take something from Arlene's presentation which is the shift of Olmsted's work uh, from city planning to subdivision design and use as the motto uh, what our first speaker, Tom Campanella, said uh, in a very provocative quote that I know that Arlene and I share, yes, of course, Dad, because I think that's what happened. To begin with, you have to uh, project back uh, to the era uh, of the birth of city planning that Bob Fishman talked about. And I chose the plan that Olmsted did for the city I know best, where I have been every year since 1958, and that's New Haven, a plan he did along with Cass Gilbert. And the city planning profession including Olmsted at that point, had in mind two things. First, the proper analysis of what was going on, and second, the proper prescriptions of what to do about it. They failed immeasurably every time in the analysis. Uh, the new city of New Haven was supposed to be 400,000 people. If you look at all these town plans, they had visions of the future that never happened. Then they had proposals for these cities that never happened. Uh, for example, they all had standards for how many playgrounds you should have and how near they should be. In the case of New Haven, everybody should be within a quarter mile walk to a 20 acres of park or playground. We have these same standards today and in fact they're impossible to implement because when you start applying them to a real landscape, you run into problems. The island of Manhattan in 1910, when the New Haven plan was done, at 10 acres per thousand, which was the standard view, would have produced uh, uh, a, uh, a 23, uh, uh, rather a 23,000 acre uh, of uh, park more than the acreage of the island. And then they inherited from Paris, as Arlene uh, very correctly pointed out, uh, these grand boulevards, uh, not just like the Avenue Foch uh, to the Bois de Boulogne, but also the grand boulevards to the railroad stations. And to get there in Paris, you needed to put through diagonal boulevards, which were in the plan of Chicago of 1909. All typical. And if you look at New Haven, there's the railroad station right here, a diagonal boulevard a tunnel under the green because you wanted to clear the traffic. All of you who have been to New Haven know none of this happened. Uh, and in fact, New Haven exchanged the emerald necklace around it uh, for a highway around it. Uh, and connectors coming into the city paid for by the interstate highway system. Very similar to everywhere else. It may be true that there was a vision of 
parks, and many of them actually happen, but based on the availability of land and money and the vagaries of the politics of the time. So you look at Chicago, and everybody is saying the diagonal boulevards don't happen. In fact, much of the plan of Chicago actually did happen. And they're not the boulevards, and they are not uh, the uh, great civic centers and so on. The process began long before the plan. And in fact, Daniel Burnham was talking in 1896 already about a park that ran along the shore of Lake Michigan. And the business community came together and they met once a week for two and a half years in the main subcommittee and countless more in the subcommittees that dealt with it and ultimately became part of the political process. They created an institution to lobby for it, another institution uh, to issue bonds that could pay for it, and ultimately what the shore of Lake Michigan was in 1892, which is a dump, was transformed by that planning process into a 24-mile-long park. Olmsted had to be aware of all of this, and as a no, number of the speakers have said, became disillusioned and went back to his firm. The quote that I have up there uh, is from the next year after the uh, city planning conference that Bob quoted from, 1910. And he said, we are dealing here with the play of enormously complex forces uh, which uh, uh, no one clearly understands and few pretend to. And our efforts to control them are so, of, so often lead to unexpected and deplorable results that sober-minded people are often tempted to give up. That is a photograph of Church Street in New Haven before 1910 that appears in the plan. Uh, you will see a streetcar there. He assumed that streetcars were going to take over the entire city of New Haven and crowd out everything, including the uh, automobiles that were beginning to be popular, and therefore you needed to widen all the streets. None of that happened. The streetcars are no longer there. Uh, and he slowly gives up doing these plans and goes into working on subdivisions. Subdivisions are often very large ones that are controlled by a single property owner or business that he can actually carry out the principles that he and Olmsted uh, Sr. had in mind. It seems to me the base of all of this, as you have heard from many other people, is the community's public realm, which is its streets, its squares, its transportation systems, its public buildings, and its park. That is the city's living room. And here, citizens encounter one another, move around, shop, do business, or just wander. For example, Ocean Parkway, the 180-foot wide boulevard that uh, I mentioned earlier. Or the Emerald Necklace, which countless people have mentioned along the way. And it seems to me that that is the most effective way of shaping a city. And so did Frederick Law Olmsted believe. And he writes in the plan of New Haven, in regard to the formation of parks and other permanent open spaces, and especially in regard to the layout of thoroughfares and transportation systems, the probable future distribution and requirements of the population should absolutely control the pleasant, present decisions. You can flip it the other way. Those thoroughfares and parks are going to control the distribution of population which is exactly what he proceeds to do. The place you can see it more clearly is, in my judgment, the most beautiful planned community in the United States. It is Palos Verdes Estates, California, which uh, he was responsible uh, for working on uh, a along with, uh, well, I have my senior moment, uh, uh, Charles Cheney. Uh, it's 23 acres south west of Los Angeles on a peninsula jutting out into the Pacific Ocean. And it was acquired by a banker named Vanderlip, uh, who sold it, made a profit, then had to take it back because the developer 
couldn't proceed any further, and hired the Olmsted firm to work on it. And they did what Father would have said. The first thing you do is you look at the topography, the drainage corridors, uh, the high points, uh, and he made a plan that consisted of dealing uh, with the ledges uh, where you could have roadways for the motor car. And those roadways go into a virgin landscape. These were bean fields uh, where they were colonized at all. And what you see is that they are installing the infrastructure for all of this. 52 miles of road, 7.5 miles of storm drains, 18 miles of electric conduit, 17 miles of gas mains, along with a park system of 800 acres, 25 miles of water lines. This costs a lot of money. This had to be paid for over time uh, by the residents who were part of a homes association. And uh, they ran into trouble. People weren't paying the fees, including the company that built it during the Depression. And they had to do something. Their way out of this was incorporate as a city, turn this into a park system, and stop paying taxes to Los Angeles. But how the place grew is entirely determined by the principles that his father had laid out. You can see them in uh, what's called Fisher Hill, outside of Boston. Those roadways are on ledges, and they allow the houses uh, to be aligned in such a way as they uh, look out onto the view, and the next house is below it, and so on. And the area is laid out with some spectacular views when the trees don't have leaves of the city of Boston in the distance. The same thing happened in Palos Verdes estates. And what you see here are the areas that had been etched out by years of different levels of sea uh, on the Pacific coast. And he lays out these streets so that you can have a park system and you can have the houses that do the same thing. It turns into this. As you can see in the beginning, there are not enough people to support the infrastructure. Eventually, this becomes a very uh, wonderful place to live where people pay great amounts of money uh, to own houses. And the houses, as you see, are arranged along these ledges, along the roadways, uh, and the drainage works naturally. And when you look at how they're laid out, you can even see Santa Monica Bay in the distance. It seems to me that this becomes the central uh, organizing element of all of this, except for one other thing. Olmsted was a planner by instinct, and he believed in community. And while you get these wonderful views for individual homeowners, he introduces public squares into this. Now, this goes back to his earliest work, and Arlene showed one of them, Forest Hills Gardens. The railroad station is supposed to be the center of the community. Everybody gathers there. And uh, the inn was built there, and he does something quite similar, but for the automobile this time. And what you see there is Malaga Cove Plaza. Uh, it is inspired by Italy. There is a copy of a John Bologna sculpture in the middle of the parking lot. But this is meant for the automobile and the entire roadway. There were four other communities. Again, they didn't know very much about retail development or the business of city planning. Um, there's a minor piece of the second one, Luanda Bay. The other two never happened. Uh, but this is a very charming community center, quite actively used, uh, actually. Oops, sorry. So it seems to me that when you look at the legacy of Frederick Law Olmsted as a city planner, you have to ignore all those city plans. And in fact, his most important contribution to city planning uh, is that he answered a dilemma posed by somebody else that everybody has been talking about today, Clarence Stein. And that is how to live with the auto, or if you will, how to live in spite of it, with a radical revision of the relations of houses, roads, paths, gardens, parks, blocks, and local neighborhoods. And I think 
He did this through the elaboration of his father's belief in the importance of a public realm framework. And it is that public realm framework that you have to look at in every single one of his plans, whether they are uh, city plans that are comprehensive or large-scale communities. And you will find that the other of the subdivisions by the Olmsted firm share the same approach. And I'm sure we have a lot to talk about now. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> I hope I hope I, I hope I'm live here. Uh, wow, <laughs> three great papers. And what I what I would like to do, because you know the audience has been uh, wonderfully patient, is to uh, to ask you know to to uh, ask for your questions and to make your questions and response uh, uh, our our uh, agenda for the rest of this session. So, the a man in the front, please. Yeah. We, we have uh, mo microphones, if you could hold just one moment. Yeah. We'll get up to you. Uh, Ed Orson from Baltimore. Uh, really interested in your th comments about the residential communities. Uh, and within the last week, I've taken two groups of people through Olden Park, Baltimore, which 100 years later is a wonderfully uh, mm -hmm. accomplished uh, residential community. But Ar Arlen, you did mention the issue of diversity. And I think for all Roland Park residents and Guilford residents, and some are here, there is a little bit of uneasiness and nervousness because those are really rather privileged communities mm -hmm. where it's said the diversity really goes alphabetically from A to B. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you sort of reflect upon that issue? I'd be really interested in our panelists. Well. Um this leads you to a touchy subject, which um, my wonderful editor and husband said, take it out because you'll open a can of worms. But um, Boughton was the champion of the restrictions that were ethnic restrictions. And so um, it, it, Olmsted and Boughton really did want economic diversity. And they tried to plan those communities, not Roland Park, because that already was expensive land and had gotten set in place. But um, homeland in Guilford could be designed and were designed to have some smaller units and were intended to have a, a diversity of income. They were not intended to have a diversity of ethnic groups. I mean, Boughton is very he, he Boughton is very suspicious of he's the one who in, insists that in in Forest Hills you don't have the Hebrew uh, uh, because people like to live with their own kind he's very suspicious in Roland pa in uh, Guilford about allowing a Catholic church in until he realizes it's a it's a dem it's a, um, a a prominent piece of real estate to make a significant architectural statement so there's, a, there's that issue that enters into it. But the economic diversity um, was intended, and the fact that it has all become greater and upper and upper scale, I think is a tribute to the fact that they built in the value. That the, the, at least the architectural standards that they put in place have held, and that the, the quality of the design of the neighborhood and the quality and care that was taken to balance the architecture has paid off. And so if you were lucky enough to buy your house in the 30s, you have a gold mine. Um, how you alter that today, uh, you've got a, a, a growing professional class. But you're, you, you aren't going to have the low, the, you know, this is not a workers' community. Yeah. Uh, any Okay, please, uh, the, wo the woman there. I didn't realize that um, FLO Jr. was, uh, he had such a distinct two-stage career. I, what little I know about him, um, I knew about his urban planning um, aspect. And I was really surprised to hear from a couple of you that there was sort of a, a great divide, um, his disillusionment followed by his 
implementing privately sponsored projects over which one can actually have some control, unlike the public sphere. Um, so I wondered when his last projects were that were planning projects, and if it was really as bright a line as you're depicting. I, I would argue that planning a subdivision of thousands of acres, whether that's outside of Baltimore or part of Queens or part of the Los Angeles metropolitan area, and there are others that he did there, is very much city planning. Uh, but it's city planning from scratch rather than the redevelopment and uh, improvement of existing communities. And uh, that's fundamental. The other thing that, uh, that I would say is that I believe he understood you needed to have this political process in place. I I'm absolutely certain that he understood that the implementation of things in Chicago was not accidental. And uh, he did not see the ability to do this in many places. He was, uh, as the speaker this morning explained, hired in Baltimore uh, by the elite. He was hired by the elite in, in Boulder the same way. Uh, and if you look at the people, and I could have done the same analysis you did, the list of who were the people, they had to, the subscribers paid $100 each. That is today about $2,100. Uh, and there were many subscribers, but they were the wealthy people of New Haven. This was not the hoi polloi, it was not the immigrants. Uh, and I think he began to understand it. It's not as much a disillusionment as the belief that he couldn't make this thing work. Now, later on, there were people who did. And I think that's, that's important. And I would argue that the planning profession is about changing cities. And if all you do is to provide the inspiration, not enough. Uh, and that and a question such as the diversity of income or the diversity of ethnicity has to be built in. But you don't get the diversity of income without subsidies. Have no subsidies, you're not going to get it. And we're not willing to put up these subsidies, as all of us who are visitors to Washington are very, very well aware. And, and if I might answer yeah, one please. piece of that, you, you say at the end um, about the, the power of the, of the example. Right. And the example that gets set in all of these communities is an example that they indeed try to, to emulate at all, uh, and others emulate at other levels um, so that it, it follows to have. Um, right, I think we've talked about you know, the complex nature of a city and all the elements that you're dealing with uh, physically and politically and socially. Um, and you know, how do you maintain that control? And I think he was very aware that coming into a town for 10 days and you know, no matter how well he wrote his plan was you know, still going to be frayed around the edges as it went forward. But uh, the vision really was important for the community and held for I'd say 40 years of time. Uh, but then obviously with changes, um, it's time for a new vision in some ways. But the, the stuff that endures, the, the really good ideas, um, in, in Boulder's case anyway, came to fruition ultimately. It's also amazing when you look at Boulder Creek that it wasn't implemented in 1910, right. but it was implemented in the 1980s. And that, that was such a powerful idea. And at that point, you had the political constituency in the city council where it came from. Right. Uh, and so it isn't that it is important to have these. They have to be convincing ideas. And that's one of the things that Olmsted Jr. and Sr. both had. Mm -hmm. When they proposed things, these were things that, if you did, actually would work. And that's <coughs> yeah. So, to it. Sometimes, if I just could say that, when when Olmsted was doing Palos Verdes Estates, he was also doing city and regional planning in the uh, the report called uh, Parks, Parkways, and Beaches. Uh, again, for this elite group that you think would have the power to implement it. In fact, it comes out in 1930, and they basically drop it. <laughs> So there is that crisis, really, between what he can do and what he can't. Uh, but if you're there, yes, there's a question in the back there. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Josh Sloan right now with the uh, Montgomery County Planning Department. Can you hold the microphone up closer? Yeah, yeah, closer? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> is it working? Yes. 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 Okay. Olmstead Jr.'s career spans the period when zoning laws were found um, a legitimate authority of uh, police powers. Did that have any influence on his design and planning, or did he have any particular thoughts on zoning laws? So I can just speak about the what happened specifically in Boulder, and as I emphasize, he really focused on the public realm in his planning effort, but um, zoning was in the air um, and was being discussed by the community, and so in 1928, Boulder adopted a zoning ordinance, um, and that was actually, that was written by S.R. DeBoer, uh, who was another major consultant in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, but Olmsted was uh, corresponding with the Boulder City Improvement Association and making suggestions and providing examples of good zoning ordinances. But I think it's striking to see his, you know, his plan in 1908 and really saying this is not a socialistic enterprise and we're really trying to create value and making the economic kind of argument, but being part of this transition to notions of, well, if we're going to control the whole city beyond the public realm and deal with that, private land, which creates the other part of the fabric of a city, uh, we're going to have to get active here and involved in zoning matters. Uh, I don't know much about the broader context, but certainly in our community, he was part of that transition and supportive of moving to that uh, private realm as well. There, there's a, uh, in the New Haven plan, he spends a great deal of time on setbacks and the importance of having enough room for the roadways to grow but he had, and his father as well, a sense that the public realm framework was the single most powerful thing that you could do to shape what private development would be. And that if you look at the boulevards and the parkways that they were responsible for, they did in fact shape the cities involved. Arlene mentioned something that we shouldn't forget, and that is their notion of zoning and regulation was based on two things. One was height limits uh, and setbacks, a ph very physical idea of it. And each one of the town plans they did, whether it's Riverside, as Arlene mentioned, or Forest Hills, or Palos Verdes Estates, they all had hmm. regulations that were written into the deeds of the properties. In addition to that, uh, you had uh, art approval. You could only do things in a certain style in Palos Verdes Estates. You had to get the approval of a commission that had major architects on it in order to uh, build your home. So it was a very physical notion of uh, regulation. I still think that if you look at uh, the approach to the public realm, that something like Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn or the Emerald Necklace in Boston, far more impact and all the zoning in Brooklyn and all the zoning in Brookline and, and Boston. And if I might add something, the, um, the restrictions also, and particularly in the Baltimore suburbs, um, and I'm very bad at computing economics, but the houses are not only, does, there's an architectural jury and, and the setbacks and, and the idea of light and air in the smaller houses was very important. They also say that they should cost X amount. And the range in the Baltimore suburbs went from something like $5,000 in the 20s to $20,000. I mean, that's a huge range. But that was, you couldn't put up your house unless it was that. But these um, restrictions were embedded in home associations. In the case of Palos Verdes, there was an endowment to maintain the art jury which therefore exists till today. But in other subdivisions all across the country, those home associations may or may not have continued, been voted. They usually had a 20 to 30 year range. And if they didn't get voted back in, then there were no um, community controls. And what happens, which is very interesting, is that when you go 
to a suburb. For example, um, I went wandering around the uplands in Seattle. Wonderful plan. And the plan very much, I think, on the wonderful topography based on Roland Park to have the pathways going through and next to houses and a little parklet here in the midst of private residential land. Well, I went searching for those parklets. They don't exist anymore because um, these subdivisions, my trite phrases, they, they evolve on a cadence according to the economic rhythms of the country. And um, they are developed. The infrastructure may or may not be put in, the roads. But then if the home association doesn't recreate itself, then the private prop, the, the, the peop, the, what should be public realm or um, the little parklets get sold. That and continues not just for, the, for that, but if you take Greenbelt, Maryland, yeah. they needed to build a, a, a school system after World War II. They sold the Greenbelt. That was the community decision. So uh, uh, what Arlene is saying is very important. Um, yeah. On the other hand, if you've got such restrictions that become straitjackets, you can find that you can't do something suddenly. Oh, yeah. But it, there was a case in Long Island where property um, in the Hamptons has you know, escalated out of sight. And I got consulted years, years ago. I was a newbie at this whole process. And they wanted to know what had happened to the beachfront and little park that Olmsted, this is John Olmsted, had designed in Hither Hills because the, the king of, I don't know, anchovies had <laughs> chosen to buy it. And they felt that it, was, it belonged in the public realm. And there was a Kate, Case and White, a big law firm, lawsuit over whether this belonged to the public and this should be park space or this could be, well, I think there's an anchovy castle there. <laughs> There's, there's a question way in the back. Yeah. Hi, I'm Charles, I'm Charles Birnbaum from the Cultural Landscape Foundation here in Washington. Um, I want to go back to the title of the symposium, Inspirations for the 21st Century. Um, Peter uh, touched a little bit on this with the, um, the renaissance that's happening now, going back to uh, Junior's vision in Boulder. And I'm just curious, um, it's really a two-part question. First, to use one of Arlene's expressions of lifting the veil on those that were in the Olmsted office, um, when so many people still think Olmsted lived from 1822 to 1957. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is a Washingtonian where we think the L'Enfant Macmillan plan is the holy tablets, and we're all very familiar with them. In these residential communities, in these um, cities like Boulder and New Haven and elsewhere, what's being done to make Junior relevant as one, lifting his own visibility and his profile, and two, how people live out 21st century life and why Junior specifically should matter? I, I will answer that straight out. The public realm, which was the basis of their work, and the public realm framework is what we need to get back to. We have to stop telling other people what to do with their property and start buying the property ourselves and creating the public realm framework that will allow the cities to grow into the 22nd century. And that is the lesson that I learned from both senior and junior. Well, I <laughs> Well, I mentioned the 1967 reprinting of the plan, and uh, frankly, I probably wouldn't have been as familiar with the 1908 version and, unless I had seen it in 1967. Um, and that was uh, a set of uh, citizens planned Boulder County. These are you know, people for good planning in the community and really wanted to reacquaint the community with his thinking. And so I think that brought to the fore in the 60s and into the period of time when, frankly, citizens took more control over land use planning in Boulder. Uh, a lot of uh, things that I think planners would point to as successful in our community really were generated out of citizen activism and the use of charter amendments and that type of thing in our community. Um, and those people uh, found inspiration uh, in Olmsted. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, this new Civic Center plan um, I'd say about half of the uh, submittals during the design competition harken back to his vision for Boulder Creek and the Civic Center. 
Um, so it's part of our, our responsibility, I guess, in some ways, of just making sure that people don't lose touch with uh, some of the good ideas, the ones that endure, I think, uh, as we've talked about before, and that those are still relevant in today's planning context. Um, but that's true of uh, other changes that were looked at as well, some of the things that should endure from the planning that was done post-World War II, et cetera. So I see this as a continuum and a legacy, and you know we're building on the efforts of people before us, uh, but the foundation that he set for our green infrastructure, really, for that resiliency has been really significant. Yeah, and, and I, I would answer the question in a different way as an educator. <clears throat> when, I, when I look at Olmsted, uh, I'm just in awe of the skills the, and the range of the skills. And I don't think, I really don't think it's possible to train anyone <laughs> to, be, to be Olmsted or Olmsted senior. But I think we do have a real responsibility that we might be able to create a kind of collective Olmsted. In other words, to, to create people who can cooperate uh, among all of these different areas and get out of our silos. And I think that's a very important lesson from these plans. If, if I may just pick up that. Yeah, please. That was one of the themes as we were trying to plan this um, conference, the symposium, was that and, and the three things that I mentioned, I think, are very telling. The, the, the three collaborative efforts that he felt were highlights, he was a man, he didn't have the answers himself, but he knew that in the collaboration with other professions, other disciplines, that was when those inspirational moments occurred, and that was when you got to really significantly long-lasting um, moments of, of design and the light bulb going off, and the, those were going to have legs. Right, okay, there's a question in the front. Yeah, please. Hold on one second. Wait. Yeah, all right. Are we, what? Yeah, okay, I think this might be the last question. Oh, I'm Betsy what? Rogers. Um, no one's commented yet on the new urbanism. Would anybody like to say anything in that regard? Yeah. It, it, it's relevance well, and, and how th that may be an, or may not be an extension of um, Olmstedian I principles. I think it's quite the opposite. I, I, yeah. uh, I thought you might say that, but I, want, <laughs> I wanted to hear it. If you, if you look at Seaside, Florida, which is 324 houses, they are all about regulating what you can do on private property. They're about front porches and picket fences and uh, pitched roofs, uh, and everything the Olmsted stood for was about the public realm, the parks, the parkways, the streets, the boulevards, and shaping the place that is our common living room, as I put it. Yeah. And it is fundamentally different. Uh, in the hands of a great designer like Andres Duani, whom I work with, it comes out quite beautiful. In the hands of many of the followers who do not understand the same principles, it comes out looking like pitched roofs and picket fences. Okay, well, well that, uh, <clears throat> with, with that uh, comment, we are, uh, we are out of time, but I hope you can all join you know, t three wonderful papers, and thank you for a, a wonderful set of questions. <laughs>